to welcome all of you to the first uh, event of the C++ user group portal. I hope that more people will join us uh, in the meantime. So, it's the first event. We'll have two presentations, two smaller presentations. One about the CPKG, it's package manager from Microsoft, right? Yep. Yeah, and uh, another presentation is called Avoid This, about the good uh, user, user practices. So, a little bit word about the sponsors, that surprising to have them. <laughs> uh, C++ and C on C is the C++ conference uh, in the UK. It's our community sponsor, Engine Brains, it uh, gives us the user group support, uh, give us the license the licenses for the ID for Raffle, but we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, and, and our first sponsor today is in a sec, yeah. where we host the event. Uh, so that's pretty much it from my side. I guess we can start the first. Um, just a quick thing. Yeah. Uh, just going to say this is like we're trying to establish a community. Oh, more here. Um, th this idea is just make this first event see what people think, what they like, what they don't like, and then we can shape future events like this, uh, different locations, different topics. You just get started. Okay? We are going to make, uh, at the end, we're going to have, we have a questionnaire we're going to send afterwards, so you can fill your opinion, give your opinion, see what you like, what you didn't like. Be, be truthful. If you don't like my presentation, I can take honest feedback. Nothing personal, just say the first presentation was very ugly, don't, please. Be kind, but be truthful. But it's just, uh, the idea is to make, get started because I think there's a lot of C++ developers in Porto and it's very nice to share the experience, talk about problems and challenges, what, how can we get better, and also has this social aspect, you know, we can do everything online, but it's not as nice. Sometimes you want to talk and discuss and show some code, how you can make it. And getting in touch in person is much better. Okay. Yep. So the first uh, presentation is by Luis Paulo Pires, yep. VCPKG package manager handling uh, dependencies in C++ project. Yep. Of course, the clickers. to you. So I'm going to talk about VC package. Yeah, I'm talking about package manager. Um, why talking about package manager? So, so many things that we talk in C++ like template metaprogramming, uh, our value references, perfect foreign. There's just so many things to talk about in C++. But I was asking my colleagues, watch your talk, and I was like, oh, uh, smart pointers and all these things, and I oh, could talk about variant elements sync machines and like this, and just like, should I go crazy in math programming and other things like that. But it, and then one of the first things uh, I, I helped my colleagues when I came here, they were some people setting up, a lot of people use OpenCV, a lot of libraries like this. I said, don't have all those folders and keep them all mess. Use a package manager. And it's something they really like, they said, look, you should talk about that because that makes setting up projects much easier. So. Get, getting their feedback, that's why I, I'm going to talk about package manager. In C++, there is no standard package manager. And your languages nowadays have Python has pip, uh, Rust has Kratos, uh, Ruby has gems. I don't even know what Go has, but that's a crappy language, but it doesn't matter. Java, Java doesn't have it. No, J, JavaScript, that's, yeah, and NPM, but that's not, not standard, but anyways. The thing is, community C++ is very diverse. It's kind of hard to make one fits all because you have hardcore embedded system where the guy has the dependencies, everything static, and the other one goes to extreme, not distribute computing and everything. It changes a lot the needs, the hardware, so it's hard to make one. There is this talk. One thing, my package manager, dependence manager, can be quite a pain. If your project depends on affiliates, it's annoying. If you're doing multi-platform code 
and you have to make the same compilation in Windows, Linux, and Mac. Extra annoying. On Linux, you know, you have to get and install the lib, and it's easier. On Windows, it's harder. Okay. That's just cool. Um, a few com uh, I work in a few companies. People do uh, different strategies to make that easier. Mono repos, just that big Git repo that has everything, modules, and everything. Some solution. Nowadays, people love single header only libs. You see GitHub, everything. I'm going to talk why this is not a necessary idea. Also, why package manager again? People want a package man manager. ISO CDP has been doing some surveys every year now, at least a couple of times a year. It's every time it shows, oh, what should you do with C++? Package manager always shows up. They have they made a, a study group just for tooling and a lot of, a lot of people talk. Package manager. Um, like I said, those solutions have these kind of problems. Making this nightmare. A different layer of so this compiles on Windows, Linux, and that version, how you keep it up to date. And it, it, it's a bit annoying. And you can also have the problem with large compilation times. Oh, header layer only layers are not interesting, but if you call it all the time, translation units, pff, it can go bigger, so that it's not always a good idea. Uh, the build system, it's another issue. Oh, uh, I want to add in CMake, find package, oh, does it, there is no, this, the, the C, find package in CMake is not installed in the system, and so Windows it doesn't work, then I have to put the lift half and the custom, it's not. Another problem. Like, and like I said before, press platform builds make this more annoying. If you work on the same software in different platforms, it becomes a bigger issue. Not everybody does this. I unfortunately tend to do that a lot. So I have to deal with that. Well, the ABC package, so like I said, it's a multi platform. It started on Windows only, it expands. It works on Linux and Mac and Windows. It's, uh, one of the things that I like about it as well, it's self contained. It adds all those dependencies, all the libs you want in a single folder. Move it. If you want to have different folders for different dependencies, you can do it. It's self-contained. Everything is there in one folder. It doesn't go anywhere in your system. You don't need special permissions. Nothing. Um, you just need a decent compiler. GCC, Clang, and Visual Studio, which is basically you know, everything nowadays. It has a lot of package recipes, over 1,200 right now. So most of Common, even in common packages, are there. Sometimes I find new stuff because they add in ports, which is interesting. It's also very easy to keep up to date. You go VC package update, VC package upgrade, not around. And you all see a little update, do it. It's easy. And it's very easy to integrate with CMake. I'm going to show you the examples afterwards. So, which is the CMake, everybody's going to complain. You can do a build system talk afterwards. Oh, I prefer Amazon. Everybody complains about CMake, but most of people use CMake. I'm not even going to talk if anybody says, oh, we should use make files. No. No. Okay? And it also integrates with MS Build very easily. Um, Visual Studio nowadays, if you're using just a uh, Microsoft project, you can just, oh, I want you add the header and already compiles and everything. It's very easy. Like I said, it's created and maintained by Microsoft, but it's an open source project. Which is very strange to say if you're older, but um, I already submitted pat patches. It's easy. They make issues. They talk. There's people working in it, so it's not an abandoned work. There's plenty of things. Uh, they have plenty of test cases and libs, and they recommend now oh, if you have a library and you want to see if it compiles in several compilers, add a, a, a recipe to our VC package. We'll tell you about it. So that's very interesting. Nothing's perfect. So, problems with this package. You need to have the full source code for library, or whatever. So, this tends to be more open source project, libs, and things like that. It doesn't have binary package support. I'm going to talk about other ones that do. That's a con. Oh, it's something very annoying. Does it provide a way to have multiple versions of the same library? By standard. Yeah, like I say, you, it, it's all encapsulated in one folder, so if you want, you can leave that lib in just that version, you don't have to. But you can do like pip, like pip install uh, libc equals equals that version. 
that's not they're implementing this but right now it doesn't that's a big con if you have to be static to certain lib you have to be careful that you have to make your fork and keep track of the lib and for now a demo it's much easier uh, slides and stuff like that it doesn't I want to show you how to create a simple project how to handle dependency and see how it works in CMake and everything and okay this is a bit okay I'm gonna have to unplug you man you have enough battery for it? Yeah. I made two simple examples. Uh, if you need to increase the screen, just say so. Okay. First, I'm going to show you this example. Um, this is a, a, a simple application that I use at sale. I don't know if you know this library. It's a Google library. It has uh, plenty of uh, data structures that are more efficient. Uh, for example, uh, um, a sorted map for studlib is very inefficient nowadays. This flat hash map is much more efficient. If you're using hash maps, Use something bad. Don't use to live for that. And so, but it, like I said, it's always annoying to have these dependencies. So, let's make an example of this. I'm gonna set up. You see package. You call. Could you increase the font size? Yep. I can make it this better. Better? Yeah. And why is this showing up? I don't want it to show the status. Okay. Better. So I'm going to this package. Bootstrap. This is going to compile the base package. It downloads all the dependencies, the CMake version, and everything. So you don't need to install anything else. It takes care of everything it needs. The only difference, if I did this on Windows, I would call bootstrap PC package dot bat. And the disable metrics is because I don't want the telematrics. But I'm... And with this, afterwards, we're going to install the packages. I'm going to show you a very simple example. And of course, when I was doing this before, it was faster. The lockdown is going to be slower. Um, if you guys have any questions, meanwhile, feel free to ask. I have. Yes. So, compared to Conan, that aside that Conan supports binary packages, so it supports building from source. So, how would you compare if you build from source with Conan? Yeah, for example, Conan, uh, it's distributed, so if you want to have a, like a, a repo in your company and you share packages, it's interesting. Um, but, but Conan also has a Python thing, it's, it's a bit, you have to read more documentation. This, I think it's a bit easier to set up, after you do the bootstrap and everything, I think it's easier to set up. I'm going to show you the command to install the package afterwards and see in the CMake. It's very easy. Um, so I'm gonna do a piece of package. Uh, here, I'm gonna do this. Piece of package install. One thing, see I'm doing the, uh, the, uh, the lib name, and then the triplet, which uh, if I was in Windows, I could make uh, x64 slash Windows slash static if I want to do it. I can make uh, slash Windows, and if I was in Windows, if I had w SL, I could also make Linux, and you can, uh, I could make ARM if I had a GCC ARM uh, cross-compiler here. Uh, so you can say what architecture you want to compile the package to. That's a very interesting thing. I'm just going to do this. It's building and it's along the source and everything. Another, it, another question. What, is, what does VC stand for? Uh, X64 
asking a question. I never care. <laughs> Visual C, maybe? Yeah. It's from Microsoft. It's Visual Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's a very good question, and I never checked it. Let me see if I can actually answer this. Maybe it's a very convenient package. Yeah, maybe. It's a, I call it now library manager. I have no idea what the VC is for. Yep, they don't say what it is for. Sorry guys, so that so becomes a mystery. When okay. It, when, uh, did it just install it from source? Or did yeah, it yeah. It downloaded the source. See, so it downloaded the source. It made a compilation. It made a release uh, version and a, a debug version. When you compile your version, then you're going to say, oh, I want to make a release, or I want to make a debug. It depends in what mode. And, it's, uh, and then it also gives you an example how to set up in CMake. Can it also fetch binary packages? No, 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 it's, for, it, it's, it's one of the cons. It doesn't do it. Kona does. Did you? You said before, you know, you should use the package manager because it makes your compilation times faster. And I object to that. No, 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 this no. It's no. exactly the case where it doesn't. But once you've done this compilation, you're done. You're only going to be linking your project. Sure. If, yeah. probably if you have a single header only file in your project, you're going to compile every time you compile your project. When you're linking, you're just linking a lib. But you know, to me the alternative is the system package manager, which will install, uh, let's, in, let's imagine it's not a single mm -hmm. file, let's imagine it's a shared object, it's all a shared object once, and I'm not going to compile it. So that's that's I understand, but if you're a root platform, you're done. If you're in Windows, that's right, very annoying. Right, yeah. okay. I'm going to show you how it works in a project, and you see, it's interesting because you don't have all the libs on, 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 on on Linux, uh, uh, there's a much many more projects here, and then you have like dev packages and Ubuntu or something like that. I'm going to show you here. I'm actually going to do the example two first. Just so you guys see, like I said, this is the code, and this is the CMake. This is the version, this I'm saying the C17, stuff so everything is optional. Buy package, give yourself, config required. Plug the link here. You're done. Nothing else. You don't have to say which uh, director it is, which uh, uh, minus L, which you live, and everything. You're done. If you're using your system, this becomes special. You have to use minus L, where is the library path, and everything. Yeah, it, thanks. It depends on all the packages installed. For example, if, it, if you're using patch config, patch config, yeah. example, uh, it's on its own line. Or yeah, one thing. Oh, okay, I have a one for project. Pass your colleague. He's using another Linux distro. Sure, if you're using another operating system where the package manager doesn't have it, that's another thing. Yeah, but if your colleague is on a Mac. Right. Yes. See, like I said, I don't if, if you, yeah, <laughs> this is a very interesting also for um, for teams. It's all very interesting. Like I said, this has finger things. Doing this makes it all easier. Because if you, oh, maybe you have the package, but you don't have this uh, CMake uh, find package. Then you have to, oh, my, uh, minus L of everything. And then you have to, oh, maybe it's on a user, one lab can you put in the user local include, the other one can be user and, yeah. like I said, it, maybe it's working for you, but if you're using more projects, you're using more platform, this makes it easier. Oh. And you also have two versions, uh, the debug and the release, which is also interesting. I mean, uh, uh, but also the one question, sorry for yeah. interrupting, no, 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 no. does it install your dependencies in your project, in your build directory or it yes. install them system wide? No, no, uh, no, it installs only, for example, my, my demo here is since everything of a VC package is installed in this, yeah. my own folder, meetup VC package, all my libs, everything is there, but for example, um, this app sale is a static, it only does a static because uh, of sale. But for example, if I'm on Windows and I'm uh, compiling a project that I live that has DLLs, VC package uh, copies those DLLs to our uh, binary folder. That's very useful because when you want to distribute your application, you just copy the folder and you're done. Everything open CV has plenty of DLLs, depending on the, what modules it does. 
compiles all the SOs or uh, the DLLs, everything you need. So that makes it useful. That's another plus. Ask a question. You're making faces, do it, man. Like, does it statically link with the standard library, for example? Uh, because otherwise, you might pass it to another system and it won't work if the standard library there isn't compatible. You can, like I said, the triplets, you can specify if you want a static link, if you want a dynamic link. And oh, if no, that, okay. that triplet is, doesn't, you, want, you can create your own triplet as well if you want to specify. Okay? It depends on you. Okay? You can specify. I want a dynamic link, I want a static link. Things like that. For example, in uh, Linux, for example, they make a uh, static link. Okay. Oh, here's. If I want to, uh, I'm going to call CMake. Here's the thing I do I say CMake to chain file, and I pass my VC package path. Okay? Then it's going to know that, uh, that CMake files, where the defined packages are, everything. It's just going to take care of itself. I don't know. Like I said, I don't have all those things. Oh, uh, interesting thing here, if you add a package, I'm going to show you the next example, it downloads all the other library dependencies as well. Here, see me. Uh, yep, making a release. This is a very simple example. Uh, yep, that. A very simple example. Okay, but I'm going to show you now another example. And now I'm doing this out of order. Like I said, this is very clean, this is very simple. And again, if you're using an order map, you should probably do this. Uh, example one. This is, I'm gonna make this, this is a, a user interface. I'm using uh, uh, IMGUI and SFML as a backend. Okay, this is a bit more complex. I'm going to show you. As I install this, I'm going to explain why this. I'm just going to the VC packet. Yes, I'm lazy. I'm just. Yeah, see here, I'm doing a VC package install on USFML, which is the package I need. It sees all the dependencies that package has, and it's going to compile everything. See, lives, I think, in Linux, for example. So, I'm going to show you. If you're trying to teach somebody C++, and you want to make a window. Oh, let me create a window, a nice interface. You have a big problem. Oh, let's make cute. That's so easy to set up and see that page. Uh, oh, let's use I am GUI. You have backhand and everything. Just to explain this kind of stuff, you have to explain class and uh, 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 the boilerplate for the, the graphic library you're using, whatever. If you're trying to help him to explain for him linkage, compilation, setting up, okay, just compile SFML. You'll never compile on C now. Get it? That's one of the things for package manager for new users to really save time. Explain for him, VC package install. It's one thing. And Qt does the same thing. It's very easy to set up a VC package, but it would take a few hours, so <laughs> it's not a good example. This is much, uh, much smaller. And you know how it looks. This main list. Cleaner. This is the more complex example. SFML, I'm you here, it's a thing. No folders, no MMSL, no everything, no mocks and everything. So this is clear, this is easy to explain. Your project said, and if I took this on Windows, this would compile just fine. And if I pass these to another colleague, I don't care what Linux, well, this really is gonna work, it's gonna work. Any questions? And this is, of course, compilation. It's going to take a little bit longer. So please ask questions. <coughs> That's a problem with live demos. I timed this to take three or four minutes. I have to fill the space here. I'm sorry, that's not going After this installation, do we still need to install the SFML? Or? No, it's, it's doing everything. 
It's, it's solved that uh, I am doing SFML has an SFML dependency. So it's already downloaded SFML, it's already compiled. See, it's doing it. Now it's lead GL. Because that SFML things. So it takes care of everything. But show you here before. When it's tall. How is it easy to create your See it's all here, SFML. All the dependencies SML have. MGN and everything. See, so in all these, I need to do I don't all these everything. So it's gonna do it. I don't care how it does it, it does it. So it downloads the patches from the GitHub, but whatever it is, it does. Sorry, what you want to ask? Uh, how, it's, how is it easy to create your custom recipe? It's very easy, it's very easy. Uh, then before, Can you submit it to the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a GitHub page. Oh, okay, see, so... Let me just do this and I'll show you afterwards. Yeah. It's done. It's compiled and it's showing an example. So, now I'm going to go to example one. Remember that CMake I did? Here, same thing, CMega, where is this 2 chain file? I could put this on the CMake list, but uh, then I'll make it fix only to my machine. It's done. Build. And you have a GUI. Yes, it's small, but then widgets and everything, I don't want to combo images, everything, and you're done. And this is a complicated library, and it's big. Cute would be, the, I guess, the same thing, which is a big library. I'm curious, there are very nice interface, there are a few other ones. Like I said, this has several dependencies, everything, and I don't care, it's all done. And let me show, for example, this package. Look how many packages are available. Let me see package. Yeah, but are they reviewed? Have you tried to? Yeah, there's plenty of packages. Sometimes you can get, ooh, Magic and Noom, Magic Get, those are very nice packages. Oh, Magic and Noom, yes, very nice. interesting. I uh, think UFL, there's plenty of things. I use OpenCV all the time. And there's quite a few modern CPUs with this one's nice. It's got a few people that tend to use it. Man, 1200 packages. Probably packaging needs, probably gonna be here. If you get everything. And like I said, if you want to contribute, oops, here, you make a fork, you submit uh, uh, the pull request, they have you may you have to sign a, a license because you're submitting to Microsoft, but it's easy, you see. Pull requests, not if I get it accepted, but, oh, update to, no, 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 everything, I'm fixed, da, da, da. Updates are uh, cute. Here, oh, people reject it. Why? But it's everything is open and you can do it, everybody can contribute. So I want this library, I want to add this library to VC package. It's easy. It's not something complicated. If you want to see how a port works, see, uh, ah, let's see. Ports. They have this, they have a patch here. And you have a port file, CMake. It's not something out of this world. If you want to create it, you want to put the hash and see. Oh, I have a couple of patches to work, and then yeah, ta -ta 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 -ta. What's the port file? It's like is it the recipe? Kind of recipe? Yeah, it, it, tell, it, it tells uh, VC package how to build and install the the library. Okay. And for example. Um, uh, packages. You can see sorry, everything is in here. Oh, okay. so, yeah, this is where this package is installed. And everything, like I said, yeah, uh, everything here is in this package. There is nothing on my system. I didn't use, I didn't need root, nothing. Everything here. Everything here is in this package. As you can tell, like I said, uh, this FML has quite a few dependencies. This is already a 16 c But it didn't do anything. I want to delete everything. I don't. I, change, I want to change this to a different folder. It's easy. It's not a problem. Remove. Those things make life easier. Okay, let me just finish up and we're done. Ah. And of course
horses is stupid. It's my, it shows no. And the final one. Uh, like I said, check out this pattern you see. Maybe your needs, you have a lot of library, uh, binaries and things. Check out Kona. It's an interesting proposal. If uh, your company has a lot of people, it's interesting. It's distributed, so it works a bit like Git. You know, you have your, you can have your like, company uh, repo, then you have the ones that have a uh, public repo. Uh, it's an interesting one. I thought it was a bit harder to set up, but it depends on your needs. Like I said, uh, there's no perfect solution. There's also Hunter. Hunter is a bit like a CMake module, but like the documentation is not so good, but maybe you guys want to check it out. I, I thought CMake, like I said, what I really like about PC package not CMake. It was just, it's easy. You see, guys, saw. It's a bang, saw, triple. If I wanted, for example, to compile for ARM, I would just have to make the package dot, um, dot uh, dois pontos, I forgot to say it in English, uh, x uh, arm slash Linux. And you're done. You're saying which platform you're done. So you can have different packages for different versions. So, like I said, check it out. I'm just I'm talking about VC package, but I'm also talking about the concept of pa uh, package manager. It's really useful and powerful. It makes life easier. And if you're doing this for a living, you want to make your life easier. One thing, people are talking about modules. Modules are not going to eliminate the need for package manager. Um, they make some stuff uh, compile faster. I think modules are probably going to stimulate people to stop doing so much header only lips and make a module so you don't have the same completion in it and translate it out all the time. It's easier. I think it's actually going to stimulate people to make better packages, but then you also need to have package managers. But you know, know how much you guys write up by modules, it's interesting. But if you're just doing it on a header only, you're just making a pre compile header. So look it up. Any last questions? Uh, yep. I have one. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you had a couple of examples there, right? Yep. Uh, I didn't see you declare the list of dependencies for your project. So, how did you uh, solve that part? Uh, but you didn't saw the find. Uh, Find package. Let me show it up again. No, what I mean is, I said that you publish your example one. You send me the example one file. Yeah. Right. I get that file. Yeah. If I just type CMake, it won't find. The yeah, you have to install. You have to see the CMake files. Oh, this is a user and say so. Yeah. So you have to install them. Yeah, by hand, by hand. If you're using Visual Studio, that one the IDE is smart and see the dependency and installs. But if you're command line, you go over to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually wondering, how is this, how is this, how is VC package C++ specific? Because I don't see anything out of, you know, from your presentation, mm -hmm. I don't see anything immediately that tells me, oh, this is C++ specific. It's no. somehow integrates with the language. You know, like Cargo does with Rust, where it's, where it pretty much is the only build system you can use to actually compile yeah. this thing. But, so, is, does this have anything that which is, uh, that understands somehow C++ semantics or that integrates no. especially well with it? Or it's just, no. just because it integrates with CMake and those? CMake is the closest we have to a standard uh, build system C++. C++ doesn't have very standard tools. So you're not going to have a standard, something that's completely integrated. This is just, okay, this is the build system most C++, they complain but mostly use it. Um, so we have it integrates well, but it's not specific. You could, uh, it, but the thing is, it detects the compilers. You know, it's going to detect C++ compilers, but you probably can change the code to detect a Rust compiler and use it. But it's just like it was made to test in all the libs of C++. Maybe a couple. There's a few there are actually C, yeah. um, but it, you can probably do it on a package. People are going to say, why are you putting a, a, a Rust or something here? But it's not a specific, it doesn't have something that's, it reads the C++ code and does something like that, you know? But it, it, it's channeled for C++. Yeah. All the packages C++ and everything integrates yeah. with C++, but it's not into the language. Let me rephrase it in this way. In 
Imagine that I'm on a system where the package manager, the system package manager, mm -hmm. happens to have some specific package I want, and it also has a CMake file for it. Yeah. So that I can do the fine package on CMake mm -hmm. and it will be exactly the same. Yeah. In that case, in that specific case where I only need that specific package and it's only my system and so on and so on, is you there any difference? In that specific case? No, no, that way you can just Because do I have to install manually in one, I have to install manually in the other. But from what I understood, maybe there's a way to install it automatically by a CMake, I guess. Yeah, but uh, you, like I said, you, you probably can do a CMake, uh, you can do some modules, but for example, right now, most of the things you have to do are command line. You have VSpec, you install it, but it's just something you do in once, and you don't install it. You mostly install your packages when you're setting up the project. You don't do it all the other times. Once you Maybe you like when you update your lib. Oh, this is a update. I didn't start an example of the updating, but it's very easy when the on time. But it's just like it's easy to keep it up to date. That's an interesting thing. You don't have to expect, wait for uh, your um, uh, distro to update the package. You can just oh, there's a new uh, bug fix. Yeah, you can use older versions and so on. That, that's always nice. Yeah. That's always nice. So you can control that. So. Depends. But like I said, it's also, also interesting when you're using Teams, using the strokes and things like that. Yeah. Like I said, here, if you, uh, you're using a uh, machine from work and you don't have root, how do you do it? You don't have it yet. I, I was I'm, not, I'm not saying it fits all scenarios. I'm not saying it fits all scenarios. Yeah. It fits plenty. Okay? So, thank you. Too much of so your time. thanks to each. This was very interesting and I hope it's helpful. The next presentation will be from Francisco Marcos. Avoid these <laughs> uh, pointers and references for um, a better code base. A better code base. Yeah. So enjoy. sitting at home saying, okay, so what, what better fits the, the first meeting of C++ Porter Group? Uh, and I thought, okay, um, since Tolkien's inventions are creatures of hobbits, developers normally are creatures of habit. So I thought, well, let's try to break some habits and talk about good programming practices. And I also thought, okay, so in my personal experience, learning how to do something how to learn to do something right proves to be easier when someone tells you how not to do something. So I brought some really terrible examples for you to look at and we can talk about them and we discuss some good practices. So myself, well, electronics engineer, I actually study here, uh, software developer, lover of C++, Gigavolt trades, so I think I, I fit right here. <laughs> really, I slide right into it. So. Uh, next slide, please. So, let's get to the chase and start with something basic. Um, access modifiers, we all know them, public, protected, and private. And in some code bases, I've seen that some people prefer to use private first, then public, and protected, or public, protected, private, and everybody has an opinion on this. Uh, from my understanding, when you are writing a library, a class, whatever, the, um, the user or whoever ends up using your class is somebody that's interested in mainly one thing, what your class provides to them. So, I think that you should order them by public, then protected, then private. I mean, try to order them by, order them by functionality to the end user, because it doesn't care what the private stuff is, he will never use it. Protected, well, if it's arriving from your class, sure, but most and most importantly, all the public data, yeah, that's what's really useful for the end user of your class. Now, this one is, uh, is a doozy. Uh, case styles. So, in my opinion, it doesn't matter which case style you choose. The only thing that matters is that you pick one and you stick with it. I mean, you can even use that case style, which is like you, you alternate between capital letters and lower case letters, but just use the same as your teammates, or at least agree upon one case style for the sake of sanity in your code page, please. <laughs> now, 
and this, this might seem really basic, but I, normally I found out there is a lot of confusion with this. Know what is a declaration and know what is a definition. Imagine the following scenario. You are, you write some amazing piece of code and somebody else is reviewing it, so doing a code review. And he goes out and says something like this, hmm, I don't agree with the, the definition of your method. And I'm like, oh crap, what did I do wrong? Maybe I, I acquired the resources in a wrong way or I'm doing some calculations wrong. And you go ask your colleague, so what do you think about the implementation? Is it okay? And he goes, oh no, 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 I just, I'm just talking about the way you declared it or defined it on the header file. I think you should use a, a boolean, not, a, not an integer, a double, not a float, and whatever. So knowing the difference between these two <laughs> saves some time and some confusion. So rule of thumb, you declare in the header file and you define on the CPP, unless you want to be in line, but let's not go there, right? Now, the final keyword. I mean, does everyone know this keyword? No. Okay, so this is not new for anyone. Okay, but uh, don't mind this. Um, it should use it to always express the meaning of your class. I mean, if you really don't want people to derive from your class and you are really sure that this is the, the final uh, derived class from some base class, interface, doesn't matter, just state your intention. C++ is full, of, is full of keywords for you to state the intention of your code, so... I actually wasn't aware you could use it there. Oh, okay. <laughs> is that compile reinforced? Uh, yeah, I think so. And does it compile automatically, you know, do the same thing as if you put final in all of the overridden methods in that class? Mm -hmm. Because there are some interesting optimizations that the compiler can do in that case, and if I could put to all of them by just putting final there, when I know the class is... But, be but if you're doing in the final in the class, yeah. You don't have to do it in the methods because yeah, you, yeah, you, right. you can't derive from that thing. If right. When you do that, it's not going to do it, so you don't have to do it in the method. Yeah, it's uh, one solution for all. Yeah. Uh, I mean, using it in the method is really interesting if you want, only want to <coughs> limit that method to a final implementation. But if all implementations are final, then just your class is the, the final class. Yeah. Just, just like, like in the, the slasher movies, you always have the final guys, the final girls. The one that's one that they accept the really. 80 slasher movies. So, Geek 3. I warned, I was a Geek of all time, so. <laughs> Moving on. Now, yeah, so does anybody know what this output, what is the output of this method? I know some of you know, so please don't, uh, don't spoil it for the rest of the guys. So, this actually compiles. Uh, FYI, there is a comma missing here, so uh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> that makes it different. Yeah, it makes it different. So let's assume for the sake of demonstration purposes, there is a comma here, imagine it. Uh, and it's actually compiled, and um, if there is one thing that C++ developers like, is when you find out, this me, and I try to avoid it, but I actually like it. When I found out that I can do something really magic and edgy with this C++ syntax, I go right away and I try to do something, oh, this is going to look amazing, and then people go into code reviews and say, man, this is actually not readable. It's, yeah. it's really confusing. It works, it looks super edgy and fun, and it really shows how you can manipulate the syntax to your will, but yeah, it's, it's really confusing to read. The, um, it actually outputs 8. Yeah, because it's pretty much is the same 1 plus 3 and then the square bracket operator A actually is the same as this. This one is pretty, pretty straightforward, uh, straightforward, and this one is also the same as A3, which is equals 4. So, I guess many of you have already heard or read this phrase a lot of times. Uh, please, when writing code, remember that you are coding for human beings. Even if you are selfish, just remember that the same human being that is going to read your code three months down the line might be yourself, and you might be playing a trick on yourself, and you might remember, oh crap, what was my intention? What was, what was I thinking? So, code for humans, not for machines. If you want to go for machines, just go and write assembly directly. So. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this one is a bit of common, yeah. com common sense. So, avoid returning... It shouldn't be avoided. Never, never return local references. Uh, another example there, uh, for example, sudo optional is a tricky. There's a complete discussion about this. Sudo optionals with references. You can get in a big mess if you do a little But then, don't, it's generally not a good idea to make references and pseudo-optionals or 
factors because if you make a reference, then the reference becomes the reference, and then you're screwed. Pretty much. It so. becomes very annoying to crack that box. Don't do it. Make value semantics. And in the end, if you actually end up doing this, uh, it's pretty basic. So the typical case of returning a reference to a local variable, I mean, when it goes out of scope, I mean, we either get lucky, we either get something, we either get nothing. The thing, important thing to notice is it will be a shit show, yeah. obviously. Um, and uh, if you really want to return something that you pretty much uh, get in the scope of the method, just, well, this is not the, the only example, but just return by copy, return uh, uh, a structure, a container, or uh, something else, or a smart point reader. Also remember RVO, return value optimization. Sometimes people exactly. become obsessed, or use our values and move semantics. RVO, simple. Just declare what you want to return in the beginning, when it's wrong, it comes. Yeah. It's coming more and more. It's coming up where we did Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no problem. I'm chatting. Um, next one. Um, when talking about the final keyword, I was talking about expressing your intention when coding. And you should do that when you declare, then define, but most important when you declare your methods. So for basic types, unless you have a really good reason to use references, just pretty much just pass them by, by copy. Now, if you want to read or write for reading, well, just pass a const reference if it is not a basic type. For writing, just pass a reference. Now, for shared pointers, if you want to relinquish ownership, you can always use the double ampersand, the uh, R value reference. That's how you tell that that method will relinquish ownership of the shared pointer that you are passing. If I'm saying something, something barbaric, please correct me. Uh, and just for sharing ownership, I mean, just pass share pointer by copy. You are saying, okay, I'm going to take a copy of your share pointer. The reference count will be incremented, so now we are sharing ownership of, ownership of that resource. Is it just a question? This relinquish ownership, just a quick question. Is that interesting? Because once that you're calling this function, once your pointer in that above function goes out of scope and you're using. The reference counter is just going to decrease. Yeah, Why do you want to pass? If it was a unique pointer, it makes sense. But yeah. I mean, this is actually not the best. Yeah, should have yeah. something more here or do something with it. Yeah, just want to state the intention. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just, I was just yeah. one of my question if there was an example that made. Yeah, should have yeah. called the pointer bar. Then you have yeah. a typical full bar yeah. and yeah. example. Just yeah. But normally when I see this, like um, you might have this for example in, in uh, for example a constructor of a class and oh. you want to pass a shared pointer in it. You either have two options, we either pass by copy and then you move it, which means, okay, we are increasing the, shared ca the, shared, the reference count of the shared pointer when constructing this class, or if you are sure that what you are passing in the constructor will be passed through the constructor and you will pretty much relinquish ownership of where, where, and whenever you're using that, uh, that shared pointer before creating the, the class and calling the constructor. So, some really current cases here. Uh, yeah, ternary operators. So, you're talking about uh, return value optimization. And it came to my attention that in, um, in I think it's O3 optimization of GCC, this, it might optimize this, but uh, some years ago, it was considered bad practice to return a ternary operator. because. When you want to just return some, just return by value, and then RVO takes care of it. Um, if by any chance you return, you write a ternary operator in your return statement, at least the, the standard says, or I'm not sure if it's standard, but normally it says, and uh, then you can check the assembly to check if it's correct, um, the evaluation of um, an expression in the return value, or in the return statement, disables return value optimization. So, if you're not sure if your compiler optimizes this or not, just simply try to avoid using ternary operators here. Just use an if else statement. Uh, and the reason why I don't see any. I mean, this I mean, was pointed out to me some years ago, and it really stuck in because I, I really like ternary operators. <laughs> and, uh, bitwise, comparing uh, both, uh, both in bitwise, and let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, I used to do this, and then I actually. Actually, I read it and then I researched a bit about it, and people were saying, no, that this is actually considered not a good practice, because it might inhi inhibit return value optimization. I was like, yeah, okay, I didn't know that. 
And I thought it was a really fun bit of trivia to, to show with you guys. Yeah. And that's only with the cat or is there not if there are any branches before that return some other constructed object? Like uh, yeah, if yeah, else in its center or? Uh, yeah, yeah, for example. Uh, I don't think so, at least from what I've read upon. So specifically that operating? Yeah. That yeah. doesn't make any sense. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's another C++ thing. Yeah. I don't know if that's true anymore. Yeah. You have to check on Godbolt to see if it were, uh, that's yeah, true. I, actually, if you use like the O3 optimization, I think it doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, it, it might, yeah. yeah. It might. Depending if you have a more yeah, complex when in doubt, update. When in doubt, no. uh, I mean, you can check if your compile optimizes, but when in doubt, better be safe than sorry. Yeah. Right, this one is a doozy as well. So, um, unless you have a really uh, good uh, justification for using uh, iterators to traverse the container or using the index of the container, just simply prefer uh, range loops. They are easier to write, they are easier to read, they are easier to use, and you can also state your intention just for reading, with a const auto reference, for writing, with simply an auto reference, and for coping if you want for some reason use what's inside the container without changing the container itself. That is pretty much the rule of thumb for this situation. However, unless you have a really good reason for using foreign loops, Prefer the algorithms already in the standard library. There are tons, this is just uh, some like six, seven examples, but there are way more. And um, yeah, they pretty much help you uh, read your code better, express the intention of what you are doing with your container, and most of the times they are better optimized. So, for example, is it better to just, for example, use the one or one range loop? to do the same thing as the std copy if or let's say find if and in the end it might be the same or you might be doing something else which turns out is not as performance is not doesn't generate many perform much performance as if you're using the find if algorithm in any case better be safe than sorry if you are pretty much doing the same behavior just go with the algorithms unless again if you have a really strong reason not to Right, now I like this one a lot. So, discovering results. Has this ever happened to you? You write a really awesome method, just let's say for example purposes, is open file for reading, and you return a boolean, saying that which states the, um, the state or the, the result of the operation. If the file was open if or successfully, or if the file was not open. Okay, but you can actually discard the result, or somebody else that's going to use your, your method you can simply call the method and be done with it. And it compiles, and if you are lucky, everything works correctly. If you are not, well, let's not go there. How do you solve this? Using the no discard keyword. It's simple, you just put it before the return type of your method, and if someone, or even yourself, forget to use the, or evaluate the return of your method, the compiler will be kind enough to give you a warning saying ignoring return value ta -ta -ta -ta, of your method declared with attribute no discard. So, uh, normally I tend to write no discard everywhere. I think it should be on standard because if you don't want people to use the, the return, why are you returning at all? So, I, I'm not sure if there is any compiler that doesn't do this by default. And then I was thinking, okay, if you put something on the code, maybe it gives an error instead. Because that would be the you know, no no compilers don't don't warn you if you don't use yeah. it <laughs> they they warn you if you if your function has a return uh, type and you don't return it they warn you that but if your function returns something and the function you're calling one doesn't use the return value it doesn't warn you at all uh, no discards are used for that I'll, you know, I always use uh, double wall so all warnings enabled every time and I don't recall ever not seeing this error but for example. Um, if you're making a library, especially if you're making a library, you don't know what the warning level that person is going to use. That way, you can make sure it's going to be it's going to show up. It's going to be triggered. The warning is going to be triggered on my code. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah, so but if, I use, uh, if I use a method from a library that has a return value and I don't use the return value, it's going to work. Okay, so but I'm saying if you're making the library okay, and somebody. If you're making the library, somebody's going to use your code. Yeah. You want to make sure they get this one. Okay. That's when you use it. This is standardized. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, this was introduced together with the 
two more, I think. It's the uh, the maybe unused mm -hmm. keyword and the fall through. Fall through, you just write it on the switch case. And the um, the maybe unused, I mean, in my team there was a, a huge debate about it because what happens when you are using legacy code or code for an interface that you, are, you don't maintain it, you don't actually need the uh, the value or the the variable that is declared in the in the method. For example, you have a void foo int x, and you are not doing anything with x. The traditional way to ignore that value is when, in your source file, when you are defining the class, you simply write int, you don't write the name of the variable. But now, together with, uh, I think it was C++ 14? 17. 17, yeah, 17. You can just write, uh, uh, parenthesis, parenthesis, uh, maybe, maybe, underscore, and use int x, and then you just can write the, the name of your variable and use. In the end, it's, uh, it comes down to preference. I really like to use maybe and use. I have some calls that say, yeah, but maybe and use, it's a, it has maybe. So when you're writing your code, you're actually not sure if you are using the variable or not. If you don't write the name of the variable, then you are not using. If you write maybe and use and you are not using the variable, uh, that's a really bit confusing. So. But, you know. This advice only seems valid if you are writing library calls. If you are not writing library calls, there's a compiler option that does the same thing project wide. But, but, actu but actually, actually not uh, in personalization specifically. We've been arguing, and I've been for using no discards for every like return error codes, and we checked it. We used minus v all and minus v pedantic and all the stuff, and didn't produce uh, warning. On some ignore to error return codes. It doesn't produce? Yeah, and it actually would be like a bug if this error would be ignored, like mm -hmm. the product bug, yeah. but uh, yeah, sometimes it just does not uh, analyze enough. Okay, okay, Visual Studio doesn't show up with um, W4. <laughs> Though it's probably like a compiler right. error, but still it yeah. happens. And it should be enforced some... by standard. Also remember, if you're in a project, uh, more people, it doesn't have to be a library, it can be just a consumption of the group, you know, it's quite close. Yeah, it all comes down to what I'm saying over and over again, but to be safe, I'm sorry, so it doesn't generate extra assembly, just generates a warning, so. Sure, but you're, you're adding something to the declaration. You're adding... And it shows intent. Yeah. It shows yeah. intent. Yeah, 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 exactly. So you say, okay, you don't discard the, the boolean that, that is outputted from the open file for any method. Bit more verbose if you want to go down there. That example, imagine if you're returning a pointer. Yeah. That's really good for catching memory leaks. If you're returning a pointer because you're passing the ownership and the person doesn't do anything, you have a memory leak. Yeah, that catches bugs. It's a normal case. Memory leaks are fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, only when they happen yes, to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, this one is, is fun as well. So what happens if you create a new class and you are in the constructor of your class, you are allocating resources and doing stuff there, that might, by some, for some reason, fail. If it doesn't fail, then you construct a new object and, okay, you have a perfectly newly constructed object of the class. Okay, no problem there. But what if something goes wrong? Then you end up with um, an object that is actually in a zombie state. And how do you solve this? How do you know in which state of construction is your object? I think you only have two options. You either declare lots of booleans saying, okay, this, this is true or false, this failed and this, uh, this isn't, or use an enum and then, then have a getter method for the construct, to get the construction state of object. And let's face it, that's uh, bad. I mean, that's really, really, really nasty. So the throw table situation, ah, this is not good. So, one, uh, one good solution is to use exceptions. Just, just the next slide, please. It's a, I mean, it's a really dummy example, but uh, it gets the job done. So, don't be afraid to throw exceptions in the constructor. It allows you to fail fast. If something fails, then the exception is thrown. And if it is properly documented, and people, people that are using your class, they know that they should wrap the construction of your object in a try-catch block. It's, the alternative is, like I said, just having additional variables, additional getter messages to know in which state your uh, object is. Uh, actually, it was pointed out by Anton. Um, I think there was a, 
like some sort of um, negativity about you throwing exceptions in constructors, and it was historically it was had it was linked to a bug in one compiler. I thought it was GCC, probably GCC. I don't know. It was in one compiler. There was a bug um, that that occurred every time you threw an exception in constructors, and people start saying, "Oh no, throwing throwing exceptions in constructors is a really bad practice. It's not good. It uh, generates something that you're not expecting." I don't know how to go into detail, I just... Read yeah, it's the... just the bug in compiler, I believe it was yeah. Intel compiler actually, it uh, led to memory leaks, then the, the exception yeah. had been thrown in the compiler, but it was fixed yeah, almost right. instantly, but you know, the gossip still goes on. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, I know the guys that the say... And <laughs> there is a big debate also on exceptions in C++ because if you're <laughs> using embedded systems in real time, those are some yeah. exceptions. Yeah, the game industry tends not to use exceptions, and RTTI, and there's all this complex. There's proposals now to make a uh, deterministic um, exception, which is a try exception, and then the scale. There's suit expected, which is going to come with C20, which returns an optional and an int, so you're going to have a return value. There's different ways. In a constructor, you only have an exception, or you don't do anything that could get it. Right? You don't want to solve the object, so... Yeah. yeah, but that's... If you have any other idea on how to solve this, this situation, we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Does this cause the problem where the destruction doesn't get called? And you might have some leaks if you have multiple locations on the destruction? Yeah, the destructor won't get called uh, yeah. if uh, the constructor failed with exception. Yeah, so you need to mm -hmm. clean up... Yeah. By hand this one, this one downside. inside the construction. Use smart but pointers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But what will calls be called? Yeah. Because the destructor is not called. Yeah. So yeah. They, they should not be they, a members of the but, but if they leave out scope, the destructor for the, the smart pointer is going to be called. Yeah, but we're talking about the scope of the object. So what I mean is, you have this object A, which has a couple of smart pointers in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm inside members, right? And uh, uh, an exception is thrown halfway through the constructor, yeah. halfway through one of them. So one of them is initialized, the other one is not. Yeah. So in order for a cleanup, it would be the, the structure would be called, which would clean them both. Mm -hmm. But in this case, because it, one of them was already partially constructed, I'm not sure that it's going to be cleaned up. Even um, though it's a smart reference, mm -hmm. just because it's a member of the class, yeah. Oh, I, uh, I know what you mean. You would have to put the, uh, the smart pointer inside the scope of the constructor. Then, after you do something that could pass some you have to make a stupid move. Ooh, that would be yeah, interesting. It's going to think anyway. Yeah. Uh, I think that's actually the, you know, the reason why it's recommended not to throw in constructors. Exactly because you cannot avoid the leaks. Because the destructor assumes that it's a completely constructed object. So you can't call it. And if you tried to make every possible branch of a, 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 a throw that could happen, you would blow up the size of the binary, which exceptions already do anyway. But, you know. <laughs> ah, come on, nowadays it's binary size unless <laughs> you're going too cranky. Binary size for exception argument, I think just let it go. We're not in the 60s. That yeah, one yeah, doesn't yeah, fly yeah, anymore. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm the guy that uses stuff. unions and variants. I'm worried about binary size. but. Doing it, calling exceptions, it blows up your eye. It's not a problem. Problem for, for me, exceptions, is when you have that exceptions, which is not the happy path, it's a bit slower, and it's not deterministic the time. When you're doing it real time, you can do exceptions. But, but it's about, if you're not doing anything that's memory related, and you have to be worried about that, exceptions are constructed. Well, if it's a trivial object, yeah. Sure. If you're like, oh, I want to access a file or something like that, oh, you're not going to have a memory leak problem just now. And besides, besides this case, yeah. we might, have, might end up with a can of worms. So. Exceptions are always a there's fun a, There's one rule, normally when developing there are three, rule, three rules I live by, and one of them is uh, it depends. Yeah. So the other one is uh, use common sense, and the third one is with great power comes great responsibility. Which in case of C++ developers, it fits right in. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Right, well, this one's, uh, yeah, sometimes it uh, causes a debate. I already had a really big debate one time, but uh, does anybody know the difference between pushback and place back? No spoilers, don't read what yeah, is on the Perfect point. Constructs the object in line, and pushback does a copy. Yeah, 
pretty much that. So in place just saves you a copy. So you might ask, okay, so why should I use pushback? Is that the right kind of pushback? Because you already have the object. Yeah, but you're but making I, a copy. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, in this particular, go, 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 go. In theory, I think the in place back is never worth. Yeah, yeah, the th that's my point exactly. Because in this situation where here you construct a temporary object and then you pass the pushback, and here you pretty much have in line the methods, the, the variables, the, the values of the variables that you are going to use to construct the object that will be put into your container. In this particular situation, yes, yeah, faster saves you a copy operation. But in any, every other situation, if you are using pushback and in-place spec with R values or L values, performance-wise, it's pretty much the same. So, when in doubt, just pretty much do a find and replace from pushback to in-place spec. Because, uh, you really have no good um, justification for preferring pushback over in-place spec. If in this particular case, the performance is pretty much the same, in the one situation where the performance is better, you end up using in-place spec. So, yeah, make perfect forwarding constructor for your classes as well. So you can use uh, make perfect forwarding constructor for your classes as well. That's good advice. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Now, um, this is a really particular situation. Um, when you have factory methods, um, sometimes you might think, okay, I'm going to have a factory method. I'm going to return a smart pointer. Uh, it's all good. You can choose to return a unique pointer or a shared pointer, but if you return a shared pointer, whomever ends up using your class uh, will be stuck with the shared pointer. If you do, do it like this, actually here I could have used outer, but okay. Um, however, you can leave that option up to the user <coughs> of your class because returning shared pointer, yeah, you are stuck with a shared pointer when uh, initializing a variable with a static method. However, if you return a unique pointer in your factory method, you can either create a unique pointer that will get you will get its value from the factory method, or you can create a shared pointer that will get the value from the factory method that returns a unique pointer because there is an implicit conversion between unique from unique pointer to shared pointer. So by doing this, you're pretty much saying to the user, okay, you are the one that's going to choose how you own how you handle ownership of the resource you are creating. If you want a unique pointer, sure, it's already there. If you want a shared pointer, I don't care, just use it like this. So it's a... Uh... There is one thing of which, where if you are completely sure that what you are making should be a shared pointer, technically, if you transfer, if you convert it into a shared pointer, it's going to be two memory allocations. That's if true. you construct it as a shared pointer, it's going to be a single memory allocation where it already has the mm -hmm. control block on the, uh, along the object. So technically, in that case, yeah, there, yeah, there yeah. is a slight of but it's, you know... It's too much of a micro-optimization, <laughs> too. If you're worried yeah, about that, you're not going to... But I know where you're coming from. I know you're coming from. I, I think there is a talk with Eric Sutter that uh, he did this example, and even initializing a shared pointer with uh, a factory that returns a unique pointer was faster, faster than returning a shared pointer. I think that the benchmark... Oh, yeah. mm, that's interesting. interesting. Um, okay, so it's open for debate. Yeah, but my idea is, unless you have a really good reason for all these wanting people to use a shared pointer, right. if you are in doubt or if it is versatile... Uh, sure, if you're not completely sure, yeah, you yeah. need pointer is better. Okay, let's just yeah. hurry this along, I think I'm running out of time. Yeah, uh, yeah this is a really trick question. How does the shared pointer thread say? The resource not, that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the correct answer is yeah, they are half thread saves, uh, thread saves. So, shared pointers have the control block and the resource they are, they are pretty much pointing to. So, the resource is not thread safe, the, the control block, which is responsible for the reference count, is. So, yeah, fun joke, haha, <laughs> don't forget to use protection with mutex and lock cards. Uh, just don't blindly trust uh, shared pointers when using multi thread. Uh, yeah, I mean, does anybody know what happens when you don't use virtual destructors? This thing called a base class, uh, destructor. Yeah, so let's say that you derive from a base class and you allocate some resources in the constructor and you don't use a virtual destructor in your base class. What will happen is that you won't be calling the destructor of the base class. 
What you wrote in the destructor of your derived class won't deallocate the resources, won't clean up the class. So, yeah, that, you don't want that. You might have a resource leak. The solution is simple. Just use virtual destructors. It helps with polymorphism. Uh, yeah, this is personal opinion, but uh, when you have uh, helper methods or utility methods in your class, some um, some EDEs will tell you, okay, so you don't you, your method doesn't need any instance of this class, so it can be static. But what is the advantage of having a static private method? No, there there isn't. Uh, wait, wait. <laughs> in terms of expressing your intention to whoever ends up using your class. Because normally, if it is public, you say, oh, okay, I can call this method without dissociating an object of my class. But if it is private, I mean, eh, yeah. You don't. Next slide. Use an unnamed namespace. Just move all your stuff that fits that criteria into an unnamed namespace. And that way, it's, it's cleaner. You don't pollute your header file with static private methods. And they still have internal linkage, so you are safe. And you have the added benefit that you can declare class and structs in a name namespace that, already, that also have internal linkage, which is a thing you cannot do with a static keyword. You are going to say something? I was just going to say, it's just like, um, static private doesn't make a lot of sense with guys. I feel like private functions, so you helpers to the public functions, so doesn't think you don't want to make a public API, and you don't want to have like this god function that does everything, so you make small plan and everything, so you should shouldn't really have the need for a static private function. Because uh, you, if you want to make static, it's Yeah, exactly. so, sometimes it happens to me sometimes. You are writing, writing a method and then the EDE tells you, okay, so this can be static. And if it can be static, why not make it static? And but then in private size probably. <laughs> yeah, okay, next one. Um, yeah, so for declaration. Many of you might know this, so this is a really edgy way of doing a forward declaration instead of writing at the top of the header file. Uh, just word to the wise, uh, it reduces compilation time, so that should be pretty much the only takeaway you need to start using forward declaration. But you need um, a warning, which is, if for example you use for you forward declare a class to use with a smart pointer, just make sure that for love of God you do not you do not inline methods in the header file. Because when doing this, you are telling the unique pointer um, class that class B is an incomplete type. So you should never, you, you should not, and you cannot do anything related to that class that requires compiler to know the full layout of that class. And it, it even goes to, it applies to both the constructor and the destructor. So if you write this and you inline the constructor and the destructor, it will fail, it will drastically fail. Uh, so, yeah, um, when you have incomplete types, just rule of thumb, just don't inline things that might, might end up using what you forward declare. And, of course, forward declare in the header file and use it includes in the source file. And, last but not least, just wrap things up, things that can help, your, can help make your life easier when coding. Using sanitizers, static analysis tools, automated tests, and um, continuous builds, multiple compilers, GCC and C length, and all those are a great combo. And uh, yeah, I mean, don't take this as something that you should use. <laughs> just an example of pathetic <laughs> or everything. Yeah, just an example that uh, minus wall doesn't have any, every warning, and there are lots <laughs> others that you might read upon and uh, see if it fits uh, your project. If you're in Visual Studio, it's uh, slash w4, for example, it's a uh, higher level. There yeah. is, uh, there's yeah, and, yeah. core guidelines. As a, as a conclusion note, yeah, don't forget to read CPP core guidelines. You, find some, you might find something useful there. And just use CPP reference when you need. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's all. Yeah, so thank you. Questions or? Yeah. I mean, you are going to have a Q&A session now. So. I have a, a question about the no-discard uh, annotation. Um, uh, Let me give you back to In the case card. you would return a vote for the methods, and I was wondering mm -hmm. uh, which is better. Is it better to return a vote and to mean that if, 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 it, if it 
either failed or uh, was successful in the method, or is it better to use exceptions? Um, let's see. Uh, no, so if it, is, if it fails, just run except. Yeah. Which is better? Not necessarily in terms of uh, intention, but in terms of speed and uh, resources. And yeah, that's like time versus space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good answer that. But for example, there is also the definition, I think, of like what's, what's a, an error, what's an exception. There is all this debate. If you want to talk about exception itself, and if you want, don't discard it, so like you don't want to. Um, it's, it's, uh, you, it returns a value or usually like a pointer. It says you have to take ownership of this value, that's important. Yeah. Or you have to do something, this could be critical. In their case, in that one, for example, maybe you want to do exceptions, or if you want uh, embedded systems, you can use exceptions, and you do something like that. So in the end, it comes down to rule number one. Yeah. It depends. Okay. I was also thinking about like the just get grabbing the image of the Holy Trinity and write all these three three rules. So we should do T-shirts, and that should be distributed at the end of the the talk. <laughs> yeah. So go ahead. Is uh, you, you don't return nothing or return a warning? Uh, here? Or, uh, yeah, it's pretty much you, you, can, you can do this. The compiler, um, it comp the code compiles, and you're pretty much just invoking the, the method, and you are simply not uh, storing the return value anywhere. You can do this. It's like, a, it's like for example, um, when you use std move. I, also, I want some examples of somebody having a string. And then calling std move string. Hey, man, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's supposed to return something, and you are not doing something. So the default value is a, a boolean, yes? Of this function. Uh, yeah, the return value is the, the return type is a, is a boolean, yes. You, you are, here you are pretty much just saying, um, don't, please don't, or do not forget to use the return value. It's, um, it's pretty much just a way of verbalizing in your code the, your intention. So there is a lot of stuff in C++ that it's, um, it's fairly human readable. And this is one perfect example. So but if, uh, if you forgot, uh, not if the error, if the warning comes. Yeah. yeah. Then what you might do is use the, the, the GCC flag to treat uh, Why warnings, warnings as, as errors, which is something you should do. No, you should never do that. You just code just like, remember the maximum C++. If it compiles, it's ready for production. <laughs> Famous pseudo last words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, any more questions? No, I okay. I also have a bunch of actual slides that didn't fit the time frame. So. Yeah, it's slash w4 for that's for Visual Studio. It's a higher level. I think the default is w2 or 3. And if you want to go higher level, you go w4. Um, yeah, I can I check, check, can I check my presentation. Huh? <laughs> yeah, let me. It's already over anyway. Technically, I can't show you too much code, but let me see if I can. For example, for example, uh, uh, yeah, for example, here I'm doing here on CMake. For example, if I'm using, I I, I have like this on my uh, to make list project. It's like this. If I'm using Visual Studio. Replace my flags, it comes to call, place this for W4, otherwise, there'll be all the extra. Things like that. And you also have like completion times if you want to do some fun stuff like that. Okay. It's just one of those things. I always have a bit more com uh, warning information. And a lot of No, 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 that's for optimization, but for example, the flags for uh, Visual Studio are different. The warning flags go from 1 to 4. It's the layer for, of uh, warning, is it? For okay. example, the, the, the uh, uh, warning label 0 is for... It's 
very low, uh, barely shows, probably doesn't show you any warning. It's for the people that really know their stuff. So warning is for losers, they that was zero. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> if you're a more seasoned professional, to actually have coded for a living, you go W4. But, but uh, that example in CMake files I was shown is because that project I compiled in different compilers. That project I compiled on uh, Visual Studio, on Clang, uh, Clang on Mac, and on GCC on Linux. So that one, it sets up the warnings depending on the compiler I'm doing. So, I think that's the word on to you. Yeah. Yeah.